Charles. I'm a professional town and regional planner at Virtual Consulting Engineers. I'm professionally registered with the South African Council for Planners. I studied town and regional planning at uh, Northwest University, formerly known as uh, Strom University for Christian Higher Education. After I finished my studies, I worked in KwaZulu-Natal as a town and regional planner, first for provincial government and then joined the local, author uh, local authority. After that, I moved to England where I started my career um, more in transport planning. Um, town and regional planning is very specialised in the UK. It's either strategic planning or development control and I just wanted to break out a bit so I started getting more interested in transportation planning and that also made me decide to do my master's MEC in airport planning and management at Loughborough University. I worked on various airport um, projects uh, but not only airports also other various transport and traffic um, type of projects in the UK and after eight years in the UK I relocated to Australia where I was also involved in transportation planning. I think the thing about uh, town and regional planning, people think it's very rigid, but um, there's so many different ways and aspects about it, um, hence the reason why I decided to go into transport planning. I know in South Africa it's still traffic impact assessments and, and these types of the, uh, projects needs to be signed off by a um, professional engineer, but in the UK and Australia it's your planners as well that get involved and can sign these types of projects off. Um, I know the um, British Council for Town and Regional Planners also developed a chapter specifically for planners. Um, I was also a member of the Australian Institute for Traffic, uh, Transport Planning Professionals. Um, yeah, and I moved back about two years ago where I started my career more into aviation, airport planning and also town planning back in South Africa. Um, the, the good thing about town and regional planning in South Africa, you get involved in the various aspects of planning where abroad it's sometimes you specialise in one of the areas and or one of the fields. Um, town and regional planning, I always see that you start with your um, strategic planning, your policy formulation, which is basically these days your um, integrated development framework, which is followed then by your spatial development framework and in, in part of that is also your LUMS, which is your land use management systems. This is basically your structure, statutory documents that um, uh, is at council level or district municipality level where all your planning applications get assessed through that. Then the next level is your basic your development for planning applications. This can be rezoning, um, consolidation of plots, township establishment and um, that sort of planning applications. The other side of it is where you may, might work for a local authority where you have to assess these applications and give approval for that. And then the, the nicer filter, what I think about planning is more your spatial um, development where you're looking at urban design, where you're looking at your layout plans for a, for a region, uh, township establishment where you actually do the layout of the, of the township. Um, so that's sort of the, the uh, various fields in town planning that you do get in South Africa. Normally when you start looking at a development or get approached for a new development, it always starts with the identification of a site. Whether that's in a township area, in a town area, whether you need to do rezoning, consolidation. A lot of times, especially with our housing projects these days, it's out of, you still need to do township establishment. And that's where you get all your various um, other entities involved, like the engineers, the geotechs, the land surveyors. Township establishment specifically, where you draw your plans and then you have to get your engineers involved in to see is there services, what needs to be done to get services to, these er to this area, and your layout plan, whether it will fit in well with, with the engineers, particular stormwater, electricity, water, um, all sorts. And then, by the site identification, you also have to do a geotechnical report to see the land is the land suitable for for the type of development that you're looking for, and then you get your land surveyor. This um, with township establishment, you get need to get approval through your surveyor general, um, and but that always happens most of the time after the town planning process has been approved or council are happy with the layout, uh, because obviously at the surveyor general they don't want to keep on changing their plans. Um, so at that process already you get your engineers involved to get advice on the services, you get your geotechs involved with the geotechnical report 
and your uh, land surveyors to do the various, you know, the pegging from first the five meter contour to see the layouts and how your layout will fit in stormwater and all that, and then up to the approval of the of the land survey, uh, um, yeah, by the general um, surveyor. The thing with town and regional planning, it's it's always a um, participation process. So you always get all your parties involved from day one. You can get through the whole process and you can get to the end where there's no approval or people jump up and say no, no, no. Um, specifically with housing development, we get to the point where the town should be established. We've got the layout, engineers have been involved. Um, part of that would be uh, your um, Application part of the township establishment application is either a subdivision, which is mostly the case, or there can be re rezonings. Um, with that, you get, as I mentioned, involvement from your engineers, your water, your, all your service levels. So at that point, after the approval has been done, from there onwards, it's the it's the council and the engineers' responsibility. Um, I think the biggest thing these days is GIS. All your requirements when you submit a proposal for all your spe spatial development frameworks, etc., is always GIS based. So um, I would say that's uh, the biggest tool that we use is GIS. And it's such a big database that you can just build on. Most of the local authorities do have um, database, uh, GIS databases. And for instance, your spatial development framework and your local uh, your land use management systems. It's so in so much detail that you, you're supposed to click on a site and it will tell you what is on there, what is allowed to be changed, uh, if there's a change of use and what is not allowed. Um, so it's a very specialised, very in-depth, but again it depends how, in what, how many layers you want to build that, but that is such a useful tool. That Environmental is a big role these days and your environmental imp um, impact assessment and it depends whether it's a full EIA, um, the level of EIA that needs to be with every application. Um, it's, it's a lengthy process and it can slow down our planning process, especially with the DFA where you have to submit everything at once to get it running. Um, time for consultation and everything. It is a lengthy process. I also know when you apply for a planning tender or job that normally you can't go for the environmental part as well because it's um, conflict of interest. It sometimes feel that the environmentalist has, has all the say and you will, especially when it gets to wetlands which is already dried up and things like that, that they want to keep and you know you want to develop and that whole um, you know process of going through that trying to get approval um, it can be sometimes a nightmare. <laughs> Um, then again as well, traffic impact assessments is also for major applications, um, quite interesting that you need to provide that um, to see what more traffic would be generated. Uh, there you can go into various traffic and transport models, I know not a lot of engineers are doing that, traffic engineers. Uh, you get um, macro, and micro, micro and macro simulation models and especially the micro, it's like um, software like AIMSIM where you can even build the streetscape with pictures and you can actually see and show your client but there's your building and this is the traffic that's going to pass there and the chaos, congestion and all that sort of things. There's various acts that we need to abide by. You get your municipal act, you get your uh, development facilitation act, your uh, ordinance. Um, the DFA came in basically as a quicker process to, but whether it works or not, because of the public consultation and the p because of the legal process that it needs to go through an application, it, it's a lengthy thing. Um, you're looking at, uh, the, uh, for a spatial development framework, uh, to develop one or review one, you're looking at roughly 18 months. My name is Peter Lombard uh, from PD and and Associates, consulting civil engineers. And the topic we will be covering today uh, will be infrastructure design for residential, commercial, industrial townships. Um, I've been a consulting engineer most of my life. I um, started consulting uh, in the 60s for about 15 years. I was working with consulting engineers. Thereafter, I um, joined 
Midland Town Council uh, as a town engineer. I was town engineer there for three years, after which I um, went on and became a, a township developer. I did that for approximately five years, but then w decided to go back into consultancy. I had my own practice for approximately 15 years, and for the last eight years I've been working for PD Naidu and Associates. For me, uh, I think hands-on design is probably one of the most important things that one must try and, and teach yourself to do. You must always uh, try and stay abreast uh, with the latest developments. Um, but in the 60s, to, to calculate the bearing and distance between two points of which you knew the coordinates was, was impossible. Um, I, I say impossible, I mean it was just time consuming. You had to, to subtract the one coordinate from the other, get the y and x differences, use these in formulas, and all these were done by hand. I'm very happy to say that with uh, uh, the software that's available today and that's become available over the years it's just been more and more um, productive to to do your designs. Um, I think as a consultant you always need to be proud of what you do and most importantly you have to take responsibility for what you do. In a big company um, there's a tendency maybe to, to think that your managers or your uh, directors or the board of directors will take the responsibility, but I think it's very important that we all realize that what we design is our responsibility. Okay, so when you start with a uh, project and you start designing, make sure that you gather the necessary information. Understand what the brief is from the client. Know who's who in the project, who's your town planner, who's your architect. Uh, go to the local authority, find out what their preferences are. They've got certain things in their municipal area that work and things that don't work. Make sure you have as much information either by physically visiting them and by taking photos and you know just just get all the information you can. Uh, obviously there's a lot you can obtain via email and telephones and so on but um, I think uh, to visit the local authority introduce yourself to them is already a good start. Okay. So um, try and do that uh, upfront. Uh, try and and do your cost estimate that they want on Monday, try and do that on Saturday and Sunday <laughs> so that you can uh, uh, spend time with the local authority, but it's very important to go and see them. Establish um, what the preferred positions, the depth of the depth zones and the elevation zones of certain services are. Uh, survey systems, um, make sure you know what survey system to use. Uh, we're bound now to use the WGS84 system, stick to that. And when you produce a drawing, put two tables on the drawing, one in the old system that they prefer and one in the new system. Yeah, in, in the Gauteng area, we work with uh, 29 going a little bit westwards, maybe switch over to LO27. But um, the Isle of South Africa goes from uh, LO18 uh, in Alexander Bay to uh, St. Lucia, LO33. And make sure that um, that you're in the right corridor when you work with it. Uh, make sure you know what the township boundaries are. Get a SG plan from the Surveyor General. Know exactly what the coordinates and the extremities of the, of the thing is because the, the whole design is going to be based on, on uh, those measurements. And try and find out uh, when this is going to happen. Is it going to be 20 years before there's going to be development upstream or is it something that's going to come in the next couple of years? And make sure you're okay with whatever's going to happen upstream and downstream of your township. Um, one of the best examples that I have is um, the canal that they built here, just off Empire Road. Uh, the municipality of Johannesburg built that in 1934. They've just come out of the, well, probably one of the biggest droughts this country has ever had in 1933, and yet. While that year was going on, these guys were sitting, planning and designing this uh, monstrous um, stormwater canal. And uh, up until today, it's serving its purpose. And um, I think that is very innovative and very uh, proactive to, to have done that. Uh, find out all about bulk services and other utilities, Telcom, Gautrans, uh, Gascor. Find out about these things and make sure that you uh, are okay with that. No one else is going to do that for you. Uh, I, I must say lately the town planners are, 
are doing the bulk contribution side of it. But you must know what bulk contributions are all about. Visit the um, site. Um, try and take as many people as is practical with you. Uh, I'm talking about your design team. Take them with you. Um, and, and maybe even the other disciplines like the electrical, the town planner, um, the surveyor. Take them all with you. Uh, go to site, have a discussion, look at a, at a septic tank somewhere, look at a building or a shopping complex two kilometers upstream from there and let them know, uh, you know, what the effect of this is. You can discuss it amongst yourself, take photographs, but make sure you visit the site. We've all got uh, checklists for when we start a design. Have you got a contour plan? Have you got the DTM? Have you got everything in place? Take these checklists, customize them because they don't all work for the same projects in the same way. Customize them, put them in your file, on the front page of your file, and make sure as you, as you do all these things that need to be done, that you uh, tick it off and that these things uh, fall okay. into place. If you, want to, if you want to do something for a client and you want the next job that that client gives out to be yours again, then maybe it's worth spending a bit of time on, on the first ones. Uh, the most important one is dolomite. Um, dolomite and water, that is something that we've all got to be aware of. Uh, this one slide shows you a whole um, sinkhole that appeared in 1968 in a residential township and I think three or four houses, three houses just disappeared into that sinkhole. Know what the effect of a disruption of a service is going to be, know what contamination is and this specifically applies to sewer systems when they start leaking, running out on surface. These things are dangerous, they're life-threatening. Uh, try and, and go for green developments. Uh, of late we, we are um, very conscious of green, the need for green developments. Green is expensive if you simply try to put a canal in uh, rather than maybe a 450 millimeter pipe. But when you get to, to substantial stormwater flows, uh, green is probably it could even end up being, uh, uh, I won't say cheaper than, uh, than the conventional system of underground pipes, but certainly from a, from a maintenance point and a long-term point of view, uh, probably the better choice. For us as engineers, it's very nice to see uh, what's happening with your stormwater. We tend to put these things into pipes and we never see what's happening to it. So uh, to have a canal with gabions and terraces and steps in it, it's just nice for an engineer to see that. Phase development, um, there's always the question, do we start phasing it from the higher end or from the lower end? Um, look at your bulk services, look at where your reservoirs are, look at where your sewer outfall is, and quickly do that calculation. Um, put sleeve pipes in. There's always a need for an electrical cable or a data cable or a telecom cable to be drawn in afterwards as an afterthought. When you've presented a set of drawings that goes out to construction, there's always some revisions happening on these drawings. And make sure that that is done in a proper fashion. Put the revision clouds around the revisions, number them properly, and explain what it is. Don't just have a, a line there that says drawing changed. Um, cutting corners is a dangerous thing to do, but certainly if it's a product that, that provides you with the same um, a specification and uh, there's no reason why you can't use it, then certainly. Right, water reticulation. Uh, you need to know what the average daily demand is. You need to know what the peak factors is that need to be applied. Uh, you know what the uh, fire uh, demand is. Uh, you need to know the reservoirs in the area, what the elevation of the reservoir is what the storage capacity is, what the static head is, obviously. The pipe preference, we've covered. Uh, uh, make sure you know what the pipe preference is, not only with the type of pipe, but also with the couplings, with the, um, uh, is it a Z-lock coupling, is it a uh, Victolic coupling, uh, what the preferred diameters are, valves, are they clockwise or anti-clockwise closing, are there spindles rising, seal types, valve boxes, all these things you need to know. Fire hydrants, very important, probably the most important. For myself, I, I found out that a very uh, easy and user-friendly way of doing that is simply to take one of your hydraulic formula, uh, put that on Excel, and play around with stuff like your diameters and your roughnesses. Um, play around and just see, you know, if I make the pipe longer but 
smaller, this is what happens with head loss. Um, it's, it's so um, satisfying to, to spend 15 minutes with that and at the end of it know exactly what happens. So when you do your design, um, there are two things about hydraulic design. And the one thing is that at any junction, uh, for continu continuity of flow, the um, sum of your uh, flows at any junction should be zero. And then uh, for um, continuity of pressure, the head loss in a system, if you consider the clockwise uh, flow as positive and the anti-clockwise as negative, the sum of the uh, head loss in the system should be zero. And then ultimately you produce tender drawings uh, which then get developed into working drawings. And these have to be clear. They must, when the contractor unrolls that roll of drawings, he must know exactly what to do. Um, you as a designer might know exactly what your intention is and how you've designed it, but you must convey this across to the contractor. Uh, co contractors talk amongst each other. Everyone says that the drawings coming from your company or the drawings we want. Then as far as the sewer is concerned, again, uh, know what the average daily flow is, the peak factors you're going to use, the infiltration you're going to use, and certain municipalities want their sewers to flow 60 or 70 or 80 percent full. Make sure you understand what the mid-block sewers are all about. Drainage zones, this is very important. When you have a, a big township, uh, break it up into drainage zones. Take each drainage zone and give it a hier hierarchy and also a numbering system. Do your numbering system in such a way that if the contractor picks up the phone and he tells you there's a problem with manual A025, you know exactly where to go and look for it quickly on a drawing. Have a pipe and manual uh, preference, the materials you get from the council again, what they prefer. Benching of a manual is a very important thing, that's where your energy losses occur. Rising mains are, are there to carry the, the uh, effluent from a pump station down to where the, it's going to be treated. Uh, make sure that that rising main can one day be used as a gravity main again. Know what your pump storage is, uh, how many pump starts you want to allow per hour, what happens if there's a pump breakdown or a, a power failure or whatever the case may be. Stormwater. Um, Stormwater is one of the disciplines that uh, I feel most strongly about uh, when it comes to uh, having regard for loss of life, uh, damage to properties, erosion. This is what stormwater does. Stormwater causes havoc when there's a big storm. You must know where the catchment areas are. You must know what the lengths of them are. Obviously, um, the slopes, the runoff coefficients that you're going to use, not only on the day when you do the design, but somewhere in the future there's going to be a development and development, as we all know, that uh, causes extra runoff and uh, that is going to create problems. A 1 in 20 year flood must have the same effect on a development uh, than what the situation was before development. The, the way to, to deal with this is to pr provide an attenuation pond. Culverts, um, culverts are things that normally take water from one side of the road to another side of the road. It can be circular culverts or rectangular culverts, but these normally, uh, there's changing velocities uh, happening at the entrance, happening at the exit, and these have to be controlled. They have to be managed and they have to be, pro uh, and erosion protection has to take place at these culverts. Know what your major and minor systems are, stormwater systems. Make sure you have a proper set of drawings um, so that the local authority can know that this is the capacity of your attenuation pond, this is the type of storm there, there was a problem with it, something needs to be done about it or not done about it. Then moving over to roads. Uh, roads, there are two aspects to it. There's the geometric design of roads and there's the structural design of roads. Geometric designs, you need to uh, look at the different types of roads that you get. You get trunk roads, distributor roads, access roads, collector roads. You need to have a traffic uh, impact assessment study done. You need to know what the speed zones are going to be on these roads. 
curvature, super elevation, transition curves, these are all um, uh, degrees of curvature, these are all terms that you, you need to, to equip yourself with. On a geometric design, you need to um, do slip lanes, um, tapers, um, bus lanes, um, auxiliary lanes like climbing lanes, deceleration lanes, all of these lanes have to be done at certain rates and uh, certain widths and certain slopes. Uh, when you do your intersections, make sure you do a, a contour design of your intersections to see where there's going to be water ponding. When it comes to the structural design of the road, um, you need to know what the kind of materials are that you will be using. You need to know what the um, in situ or borrow material is. Um, these classifications normally vary from a G1 right through to a G9 and you must know what the properties of these different materials are. To do a structural design on the road, you need to be scientific in your structural design of the road. How much traffic is going to be on the road? Heavy traffic, E80s. Um, what the design life required for the um, uh, um, road is, if any maintenance, to what, de what degree, um, what surfacing type are you going to use? What are the weather conditions of the area in which these roads are going to be built? Um, one needs a, a proper geotechnical investigation, a centre-line survey, if, it's, uh, if you're talking national roads and provincial roads. Uh, uh, these things are all in, uh, is information that is required before the design of the road can take place. As far as risk is concerned, I think it's important for you to think that you are not insured. Uh, make sure that, that when you do a design, that you are, um, that the risk you're taking is a calculated risk. In summary, I can say that uh, over the last decades, over decades, standards have been set, they've been tested, they've been revised, uh, so they're there, make use of them, um, do whatever design you do, do it according to the minimum standards that are required. Always make sure that safety and quality of life is number one on your list of priorities. Take ownership of your designs, be responsible. You need continuous professional development. You need to continuously step up and make sure that you have the latest design software, the latest methods to your, to your um, at your fingertips.